I would just like to open in prayer before we get started. So, Lord, we're just grateful for the chance to be here, for the power of your truth in your word, for the power of your spirit that lives inside of us. And we ask for revelation, as, as was already said today, that, that, that we can never plumb the depths of the wisdom and the knowledge and the glory that, that you carry. But we want more. We're hungry. You said those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied and filled. And we are hungering and thirsting for more of you today, less of our carnal nature and more of you. So we say open the eyes of our understanding and help us leave here with a greater knowledge and wisdom and understanding of who you are, but also who we are as your representatives here in the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so what I'm calling it today is revolving the now and not yet of God's kingdom. And it's a little bit of a takeoff on last week, which I started, which was called In the Presence of the Future. And it, it has to do with this idea that Jesus speaks often in the Gospels about the kingdom of God. Many of the parallels talk about the kingdom of God. The most famous verse in John chapter 3, verse 16, a lot of you know it, I'm sure. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Prior to that, though, Nicodemus approaches him and says, hey, wow, like we know that you're doing miracles here. It has to be. And, and Jesus speaks in a little bit of a cryptic language about the kingdom. He said, unless you can see the kingdom, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom. And unless you're born again, unless this light goes on on the inside of you, you can't enter the kingdom of God. And many people think that's the not yet part. See the title? Now and not yet. But, but we want to make the case that it's also now. You enter his kingdom now when he becomes the Lord of your life. And I know many of you know about that little track that uh, Campus Crusade for Christ did many years ago, and it showed the picture of the throne uh, in your heart and who's sitting on the throne of your heart. They, they handed out billions of those tracks. So many people came to the Lord through that ministry, and, and it's really the Lordship. And Jesus said, the kingdom is inside of you. That means to the extent that we're willing to submit to him, he's the Lord of our lives. But then he also said to pick up your cross daily. Now, now, why would we have to do that? Well, because there might be one more thing that you need to let go of. Just maybe. I'm just, just it's a hypothesis I have. So the, the not yet is great, but I want you to, to think about it, that we can pull the not yet into now. That's how it's worded in the New Testament, because it talks about the Holy Spirit being a down payment. You know this one, right? It's also a seal. God has sealed us as his own. And we're living in the contention of, yes, I can't wait to be with him. To be absent from the body is to be present for the, with the Lord. But Paul said, but it's to your advantage. I don't think he was on an ego trip. I think he just had so much revelation. It's to your advantage that I stay. But either way, we win. And really, we should be the people with the most hope on the whole planet. Because if we really understand what it's like to receive the not yet now, you're never going to want anything else. You're never going to want the counterfeit when you can get the real thing. So I'm going to try to back that up. And I love the Apostle Paul. I mean, I'm a marketplace minister. I still have a, a day job kind of thing. And he's a tent maker. And he's writing all this scripture out. And every time I thought about maybe I'll just retire from that job and come and work for the church, it was like, well, pray about it. And then I would read Paul saying things like, I'm not coming to be a burden on you. <laughs> and that meant financial burden. I'm not asking you for anything. He said, in fact, the father saves up for the children, not the children for the father. I was like, okay, Lord, try for another year. And that was like a long time ago. So praise God. And, you know, he, he has a way of getting right to the point. And I don't even think he realized that the letters he was writing were going to turn into scripture. It was just a father, that, this apostolic figure that, that raised up churches like the one in Philippi, which was the jailer, right? The very guy that was ready to kill himself started the first church in Philippi. Talk about a turnaround God. What the devil meant for evil, God turned around for good. So here, this is in Ephesians. I'm saying the now and the not yet, and then in Ephesians 1. I mean, you could read this. There's a paragraph. It's one long sentence, and it's really hard to just kind of jump in the middle somewhere. But he basically says that when I pray for you, I'm praying that your, your spiritual eyes, your eyes will be enlightened. Isn't that a great word? Like the light goes on. 
And how many experienced that when you got saved? I remember my mom was the one that was witnessing to me, and I, she kept putting tracks in the bathroom and everywhere where I couldn't avoid them, you know, and I'd have to look at them. She was an evangelist, when I tell you. And then she just said, well, just, you know, keep this little New Testament by your bedside. And I finally said, you know what, I'm going to read the stupid book and prove that she's wrong. And she went, yes. And I bet God did that too, right? Because many people have done that. And, and then you have to eat the humble pie. <laughs> and it was in Galatians 5 when the light went off one day as I was reading scripture. And it said that your flesh and your spirit are at odds with each other. So you can't do the things you want to do because the spirit wants to lead you into a holy life. But the carnal spirit that you were born with, it's, it's a lot of things, but holy isn't one of them. And it's like, ding, ding, ding. My eyes are opened. There's a spiritual war going on. It's not, the sexual act is not just a physical thing. There's a spiritual element to all of this. And there's a reason we do it on an altar. And we make a vow. And we invite all our family and friends to say, you can hold us accountable. This is not justice of the peace contract. This is a covenant commitment that we're making to each other. And what's, what's happened to that in the culture? So I mean, we have to be the plumb line for the truth. And Holy Spirit is the game changer. You can't accept the Lord unless the Holy Spirit is the one that prompts you. And it says that he poured out his spirit on all flesh. So it's dormant inside the unbeliever. The devil has blinded the eyes of the unbeliever, but he's praying for this church in Ephesus, which is a very carnal city. Right, that's where the temple of Diana was and all that like witchcraft stuff was going on. But how is that any different today? So he's praying that their eyes would be enlightened according to the working of his mighty power. Right, so God's mighty power is what enlightens us and turns on the light switch, which, we, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him as, at his right hand. How much power do you need to raise somebody from the dead? That's a lot of power. His mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand, far above. Can you say that? Far above all principality and power, might and dominion, and every name. We sang it. You're the name above all names, worthy of our praise. Let us make you famous. One of the Psalms says, not unto us, Lord, but to your name be the glory. Not only in this age, here we go. Not only in this age, but what else, but also that which is to come. So there's the now and the not yet. This age and the age to come. We, we looked at a similar verse from Matthew uh, last week where he's, he uses this language. So it isn't meant to just be this verdict that for the rest of your Christian time here, you're going to be persecuted by unbelievers and you're going to try to share your faith and, and it's going to be nothing but horror stories. No, like I said, we should be the most hopeful people in the world. We've got the truth of the word. Our security is, is found in our, we're anchored to the rock of Jesus Christ that we know whom we have believed in. And we are persuaded that he is able to keep that which he has committed to us against that day that we meet him. And we would love to hear him say, come on, what? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Does that mean we have to be perfect? Of course not. Of course not. But should we be pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high calling that's on your life? Could you look at somebody and say, there's a high calling of God on your life? Let the penny drop on that one. It's going to be different for every one of us. Like Lisa came up here and talked about this first choice. Uh, there's a calling on the girl that runs out. Her father was a pastor in town here, Peter Pendel. Amy Pendel is his daughter. She's been running First Choice for years. There's a great call of God on that lady's life. She's opened up five homes. Or I guess there was one. But there's five in existence right now. There's thousands of women being ministered to through that. That's a marketplace ministry. And there, she found her calling, and she's walking it out. And, it, and when that happens, like, why wouldn't God want every one of us to know our calling and walk it out? He does. And if we do that in the church, it's, it's got to flourish. It's got to have an impact on this whole region. So we're aiming for the, the not yet to come into the now through the power of revelation, through the Holy Spirit. 
Some of you are looking at me a little quizzically. That's okay. It's early. <laughs> Romans 8 says, I'm still sticking with your eyes will be enlightened. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the de dead dwells in you. Yes. Who's the him? Somebody said Jesus, but that's not what it says. It says, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. So the Father gave you his spirit. That's what this says. It's King James Version. It's not some weird translation. God the Father put his spirit inside of you. That's mind-boggling, isn't it? But then we also know through his spirit, right, that's, that's how he gives life to our mortal bodies. I have a mortal body, but there's life in here from God that keeps me anti-gravity. <laughs> we serve an anti-gravity God, right? Like, come on, Lucy, 90 years old, one of the first ones here every Sunday morning to come in and pray. <laughs> anti-gravity God, it's amazing, right? Galatians 4, though, I put double portion, father and son, because it also says in Galatians 4, 6, because you are sons and daughters, of course, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So we have the spirit of the father and the spirit of the son. I'm excited about that. I think that's the best news I heard all day. And a reason to be filled with hope and not despair. 2 Corinthians 4 says, so we have no reason to despair. See if we can pull the not yet into the now and say, yeah, it might be a rough situation I'm going through, but the Bible said I would get some persecution. I'm willing to take a stand. This was how the early church grew. There was nothing the world could offer them that was better than what they knew they got when they got saved. They knew there was a resurrection coming on the other side of death. Many of them put right on their tombstones, resurgum which is the word resurrection in Latin. I know I'm coming up out of this thing. <laughs> and we kind of lost a little bit of that along the years, over the centuries. And, and we just, again, think like, well, at least I got in. I know my name's in the Lamb's Book of Life, and I won't go down that trail. But no, we have no reason to despair in this age, the now and the not yet. So that's what I mean by resolving this. Like, there, there can be a confusion among people. Sometimes they'll read in, in Matthew 13, there's parable after parable. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Not, not realizing that Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God in operation in this world. It's like a mustard seed. It's the smallest of all seeds, but it grows into this big tree. That's the kingdom in the earth. Why else would Jesus who never went more than, what, 30 miles away from his home. He was a carpenter much longer than he was in ministry, never went to any formal schooling, and he's still considered the greatest ethical writer of all time, and he didn't even write it. Never wrote a book. Number one of all time, right, the Sermon on the Mount is considered by secular philosophers the greatest discourse on ethics. How could that be? There's got to be an unfair advantage somewhere, and it's called the Holy Spirit. The truth and the Holy Spirit. And these Christians were so different than the pagans around them that the pagans were just attracted to the peace they were carrying and the power that they saw demonstrated. If you read Acts 8, the, the, that, you know, the Samaritans were kind of the outcast people from the Jews. Philip goes right down there as one of the elders and starts healing people. And they're seeing miracles happen. Why wouldn't God want us to be those people doing that today? Well, of course he does. Will we, will we be right 100% of the time? No. But that's not what this is about. It's not about my personal reputation. Oh, it might make us look bad. Remember that clip from Ken Fish we were talking about last week when Peter Wagner and John Wimmer were running a class and people were getting healed? They got fired because people were getting healed in their class and delivered from demons. So what's the thinking there? Let them keep their demons. It's making us look bad. Dude, we're going to be accountable for that can't be about my reputation. Just obedience, right? Blessing comes from obedience. Yeah. Hallelujah. We have no reason to despair, despite the fact that our outer humanity is falling apart and decaying. Oh, well, there's gravity again. It just keeps wanting to pull us down into the dust. From dust you came, you got raised up, and it just keeps trying to pull us down. No, God is anti-gravity. 
despite the fact that the outer humanity is falling apart and decaying, our inner humanity is breathing in new life every day. That's a good picture of the not yet coming into the now. You see, the short-lived pains of this life are creating for us an eternal glory that does not compare to anything that we know here. Now, he's, he's writing this to people who also, Corinth was a very secular city, not too far from Athens, and it was a big port city where there was just a lot of sin, a lot like here in New York, right? Like, they call it Sin City for a reason. It sounds so nice, Frank Sinatra saying, they had to name it twice. New York, New York. The Big Apple. Well, a big temptation, right? It's, it's a big Eve temptation. Tries to eat people. But no, there's lots of Christians there doing the work of the Lord. So these things are short-term. They're short-lived pains of this life, and they're creating for us an eternal glory that doesn't compare to anything in this world. What we have coming gives us the hope to keep pushing forward and listening to the voice of God. We did a prophetic conference here to help train people on how you can become better at hearing the voice of the Lord. And it's all still up online. You can, you can get it. It wasn't that long ago. Actually, the school, you, you know, that was 22 weeks. But the, the recent We Prophesy conference is all up online. But you could still go on, online with the password and register for that longer course of 22 weeks that was awesome too all right so this is good second corinthians 4 18 says so we don't set our sights on the things that we can see with our own eyes all of that is fleeting it will eventually fade away instead we focus on the things that we cannot see like if i said that to somebody on the day job they'd be like dude like that doesn't even make sense like what are you talking about how can you focus on something you can't see? That's a contradiction. And Christianity does seem like a contradiction to a lot of people. For the little bit of the, of the experimentation, they might have even looked at it. They kind of write it off quickly. But what does it say? Like, you know, if you get questioned. But Hebrews 1, 11 1 says, Now faith is the substance of the things that you hope for, the evidence of things not seen. So God gives us evidence of this unseen world. What would that be? Also in the book of Hebrews, we're surrounded by a great what? Well, what, what was he talking about? All the people that are, that are listed in chapter 11 as examples of people who by faith did this, by faith did that. The whole idea of you even getting saved had to be by faith. Because it doesn't really make sense, right? When I, my mother was witnessing to me, I'd say, man, do you believe in Noah's Ark? Like, really? You believe Jonah got swallowed by a whale? And that's what people do. They try to rationalize all of this stuff. They don't recognize the immensity of God's miracle work in power. Because it's also threatening to their worldview, and they're afraid that they're going to lose their friends, and they won't be able to... Like, how many times have you heard people say, I was afraid he was going to tell me I had to go to Africa as a missionary? <laughs> Like, wait, wait a minute. He gives you the desires of your heart. When you delight yourself in him, he puts the desires in you. And if he tells you to go there, you'll be really happy about it. He didn't tell Trisha that one. <laughs> or me. I'm glad we like it here. So all of that is fleeting in the earth. Instead, we focus on the things that we can't see. And you can back that up right there. The evidence of the things that are hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I'm sorry, the substance of things hoped for. And, and one of the things that just came to me was the, the, the Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11. By faith, Abraham did what? Was willing to offer up his son. Believing, it says in another place, that God, even if the, even if the knife had come down, had enough faith to believe that God would raise him from the dead. Wow, you could build a good church with people like that. They're being obedient to the Lord. They're, and he didn't even have the written Bible. That's another day's topic. But there was enough of a, of, of a truth of the word in him that he knew he could trust God. Goes outside. God makes him this promise. I'm your exceeding great treasure, Abraham. Yeah. And we should all be living like that. Amen? <laughs> Could be a little bit of a surprise look on the guy's face on my job. Like, really? That's how I looked when I realized there was a spiritual war going on. It's like, oh my God, she's been right. The devil's been trying to take me out. 
And it wasn't long after that that I said yes, you know, because I recognized that Galatians 5, when, when I understood there was a war going on, then my eyes were open and I didn't want to go do that stuff anymore. And my friends actually thought I got arrested and that, that I was called a narc. You know what a narc is? Like you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna rat them out so you get a lesser sentence. <laughs> because there's no way you changed. You were leading the decadence. And now you're going to be a preacher. Right, it's got to be a scam. <laughs> but God, it's amazing. So how could you ever take yourself so seriously, right? Like, it's not about us. It's about his greatness working in us, and, and, and we're just willing to yield to it because some amazing kingdom transactions are happening and people are getting saved and set free and healed and, and transformed into who God wanted them to be. They're taking Saul's armor off of that fake identity, and they're getting their slingshot, and they're taking down giants. Sign me up. And then he says, instead, we focus on the things which we cannot see, which live on and on. The things that we cannot see live on and on. And, you know, Billy Graham was famous for saying he never saw a car, a hearse going to the uh, cemetery with a trailer behind it. You can't take it with you when you go. John Wesley apparently decided to give everything away before he died and died with just basically the clothes on his back because they had their hopes in a different city. They, they were planning on what was going to happen. This could be for any age, is that we understand. They live on and on. The things that we do for the Lord live on. It doesn't matter if other people know about it or not either. That's another important thing to remember is that you don't have to promote yourself. Your gifts will make room for you and bring you before great people, men and women. Amen? So what about 1 Corinthians 10, our placement on God's timeline? This is another thing that the Jewish people were very, very aware of, but the heathen in some of these other cities like Ephesus and Corinth did not have the history of the Jewish people. The Jewish people followed the, the feasts. They, they had Sabbath every Friday night. They, they prayed together. They read scripture together. There was a, a complete community of the Jews, and it's a good thing, too, because they've been persecuted for all these thousands of years, and they're still standing. Amen? It's the power of, of the word of God and, and living their lives in obedience to him to the degree they are, right? Like, I can't pass judgment on that. But he says to the Corinthians now, who don't have the Jewish background, I want I wouldn't want you to be ignorant of our history, brothers and sisters. So he's talking to the Corinthians. I'm going to come over here just say hi to you folks over here. He's talking to the Corinthians who are heathen, right? They don't have any Jewish history. So he's calling them brothers and sisters. So when he says ours, he's including them in because you became part of the family. That's why they call each other brothers and sisters. And many of the families rejected the, the early Christians, so I, I wouldn't want you to be ignorant of our history, brothers and sisters. Our ancestors were once safeguarded under a miraculous cloud in the wilderness and brought safely through the sea. Together they were sustained supernaturally. How about you? Have you been sustained supernaturally? Do you get manna from heaven in all kinds of different forms, right? Like there's no way I'm alive if I didn't get saved. Like right now, I would not be alive. I know that. So like I said, how do you get prideful about that? It's all house money, we used to say. <laughs> we're playing with house money. Every day's a gift because you shouldn't be here. Together they were sustained supernaturally. They all ate the same spiritual food, manna. Now if you're from Corinth, you're thinking, wow, okay, so God provided all the cloud in the wilderness, which, you know, would have kept them out of the sun and brought them safely through the sea, like miracle after miracle. And they were getting this food and manna. And then it says in verse 4, they all drank the same spiritual water flowing from a spiritual rock that was always with them. For the rock was Christ, the anointed one, our liberating king. And I thought of the bilocation term that we heard on Wednesday night. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, we had a guest minister here. He, he did a great job, Chess. Chasden Strickland, you should go back and listen to that from Wednesday. He talked about bilocation. So Jesus was in heaven and on earth, right? And we are seated in heavenly places, and yet we're still living in this life that doesn't always feel so heavenly. <laughs> so the Corinthians are saying, wow, they had all this going for them. God was going before them, cloud by day, fire by night, manna every day, which I guess they got sick of. 
Despite all of this, they were punished in the wilderness. Anybody remember why? Book of Exodus? Murmur. Isn't that a cool word? Murmur. It sounds like what it is, like murmur. Murmuring and complaining, man, he's not big on that, right? God is not big on murmuring and complaining. You don't get a lot of points for that one. In fact, Patricia did a message on this a couple years ago, right before we went to uh, Israel, and a bunch of people on the trip didn't know that she had just preached that message. And me and her were looking at each other like, can't complain, you just preach on this, can't sit. She said, fast from negative speaking. <laughs> so that's basically like nothing coming out of your mouth unless you just filter it first. And we were going through the normal stuff. Anytime there's a trip, it went probably even a little bit worse than normal. And I kept saying to all the other people that were Christians on the trip, you need to listen to her message. It was really good because you're complaining a lot. Like, but we have reasons to come. I know, but look, there's spiritual power in being different. Like there's, God doesn't like it. He doesn't like the murmuring and complaining. And they were punished in the wilderness. And you might think about this too. Like for how long were they in slavery? Hundreds of years, right? At least 400 years they were in slavery. And you develop a slave mindset. When you're captive, you stop thinking about being free. There's a lady named Yanmi Park that wrote a book about North Korea. She escaped, miraculously escaped. She said, I didn't know what freedom was. It wasn't a concept on the list that that would ever even be a choice. God was the president of their country. He was God. They were all dying. They were all starving. They had to eat grass in order, in order to live. Amazing. Right? We don't realize how good we have it here. But see, they, even though they were getting the manna, then the manna wasn't good enough. Even though they had cloud by day, fire by night, it was part of that old mindset of being a captive. And I'm not trying to criticize anybody here, but we better take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And, and you have a choice every day to be grateful. Every day. Yes, you also have a choice to be really negative and think about what you don't have. That's what Adam and Eve did in the garden, just as a little reminder. There was only one tree they couldn't eat from. They had everything else available. And Satan convinced them, well, God's holding out on you. And Satan will try to attack God's character and the character of the person up in the pulpit. Yeah, well, they're not perfect. People in the pulpit aren't perfect. But he'll do anything he can to keep you away from the truth and the power of the Holy Spirit. So it says, despite all of these blessings that they had, they were punished in the wilderness. And all these things, meaning the punishment for the lust and the idolatry and the complaining that they did, which you can go into. But those are all sins of the flesh, right? They were punished. All these things happened for a reason. Ironically, to sound a warning, they were written down and passed down to teach us. Hmm. So human nature doesn't really change, does it? They were written down and passed down to us to teach us. They were meant especially for us. He has to say it twice just to get their attention. <laughs> because the beginning of the end is happening in our time. Now, there you go. There's another choice. You could either say, well, what are you waiting for? Get us out of here. Or you could say, hold on a little bit longer. I want to bring my neighbor to the baseball game this Friday night. I want to see him get saved. That's what Paul said. The love of God is what compels me to keep doing this. And if it's not love, then what is it? Build a bigger ministry, build a bigger 401k, all those things. Well, uh, you know, those things are important, but it can't be what's on the throne. Christ has to be on the throne. He doesn't want one person to perish, right? So they were meant especially for us because the beginning of the end is happening in our time. And I don't know if you remember this, but I touched on it last week, these three stages, right? So the, the age of the flesh was after they sinned and before Jesus came. And then you see the between the times now where that red arrow is coming down. Not really, though, at the birth of Jesus. It was at the resurrection of Jesus when that really started. That's when the new covenant started because he defeated death, not by dying on the cross, but by coming out of the tomb. Death could not hold him. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then a short time later, Holy Spirit gets poured out on all flesh, all because of the obedience of the Son. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live by the flesh, I live by the 
or faithfulness is another translation. A translation, sorry, transaction on the brain here. I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God. He's my model. Father, take it away from me if you can. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. That's the faithfulness of the Son of God. So you're going to be, God is going to challenge you to do some things that seem pretty outlandish. And you got to know yourself. you got to hear. But, I mean, there definitely is wisdom in a multitude of counselors, right? So you're surrounded by people who want you to flourish spiritually. So bring it out. Talk to people. This is what I feel like the Lord has prompted me to do. And Wow, we would love to see that happen, right? That you find your calling and fulfill it. That's called flourishing in the spirit, right? So the beginning of the end times. So we're not, I'm not talking, you know, about the, the imminent return of Jesus. He said no man knows the day or the hour. And whether it was tomorrow or a month from now or 10 years from now, why should that have any difference on the way I live? If I want to be about the Father's business, whether he's coming back or not, should it matter? I should be still very urgent about getting the word out there to people. And it's not just about me. Man, it's this community of people that he brings. And then he brings new people into the community. And they get loved in. Right? So it's the post-resurrection period that we're in. And then, then his final return comes. So that was last week's teaching that's what the kingdom is about, that we're in this between the times. He resurrected, and he hasn't come back yet. And then he gave us his Holy Spirit, right? That's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which is the now, but the final has not come yet. So we want to bring the not yet into the now. It's only about the fifth time I've said that, right? So what's in heaven is available to us now through Holy Spirit. What stops that is our flesh ruling us and trying to kick him off. The throne of our heart. Anybody else have a belligerent personal spirit that tries to kick Jesus off? Building a little, uh, what, what do they call that? When the, when the floor drops out and you, and you, and you fall through the floor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what my flesh wants to do. So, King, open enrollment, I love that expression because, you, you know, again, it's, it's easy to forget. Like if you read John chapter 4, it says that. The Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. Remember that? Right? Like, so there's, this has happened forever that people judge one another just based on immutable characteristics. It's not her fault she was born a Samaritan, the woman at the well. Right? So they had nothing to do. So Jesus talking to the woman of Samaria, that was a big deal, and she knew it. But the point is, open enrollment meant that the Jews that became Christians now had to accept those people that they had looked down upon. I'd say wrongly looked down upon, but it's what their leaders were teaching them indirectly. So for the people who are stumbling toward ruin, guilty, that was me. Anybody else? Before you knew the Lord, were you stumbling towards ruin? I'll wait. <laughs> yeah. The message of the cross, I would mock my mother. It's, it's nothing but a tall tale for fools by a fool. But for those of us who are already experiencing the reality of being rescued and made right, it's nothing short than God's power. No man could have pulled you out of that mess. But God's power stepped in and said, you know what, there's no pit too deep for me that I can't reach down and pull you up out of that pit. And I'm really grateful. Thank you, Lord. And then the next verse is, this is why the scripture says, I'll put an end to the wisdom of the so-called wise. And I will invalidate the insight of your so-called experts. That's a verse, Isaiah 29, 14. So Paul now gets really like in your face. This is what happens when you stay in the marketplace. So where's your philosopher? He was with them, right? In Athens and Corinth and Ephesus. These were all cities where, you know, when he got put on trial, he, you know, who, what's his babbler talking about? No, no, he had the real deal. Where's the philosopher? Where's the scholar? Where's the skilled debater? Bring the best one you got. Step up. <laughs> I love this. Step up if you dare. I really feel like the Lord is saying that to the church. Step up or stand down. If you're going to complain about the culture but you don't want to run for office, kind of empty. Are you willing to do anything to, to change the culture or are you just going to complain about it? I'm looking in the mirror now, right? I'm not, not trying to point a finger here. We, we got to step up or stand down. Just 
don't talk about it if you're not willing to do something about it. Anybody could call out the problem. How about become part of the solution? Run for school board. The, the former uh, executive director here, Joel Davis, is now on the school board in um, Hillsborough. Yeah, and strong Christian knows the word, really powerful. Step up if you dare. Hasn't God made fools out of those who count on the wisdom of this rebellious, broken world? Do we live in the American culture as a rebellious, broken world? Read the paper. Does anybody read the paper anymore? Look online. It's a mess. It keeps going in the wrong direction. We tell a different story. We proclaim a crucified Jesus, God's anointed, who embodies God's dynamic power and God's deep wisdom. God's foolishness will always be wiser than mere human wisdom. Can you just think about this in your, in your mind for a minute? When you knew what everybody else on your job would have done that wasn't saved, but you decided not to, and how that came back and paid dividends to you later because you didn't get drunk at the Christmas party or, you know, fill in the blank. There's a million things. But at the time, they're kind of persecuting for being the oddball out until they need prayer. So God's foolishness will always be wiser than mere human wisdom. That says if you're obedient, if you know the word and Holy Spirit's directing you and you know how to recognize his voice, any choice he tells you to make is going to be to tell the truth. But so many people around you don't know that, and they're really good liars, right? at least my day job, really good liars. They come from all over the world, you know, and, and the companies are the, who the companies are, but they seem to promote it. I'll just, I'm just saying, there's a lot of conflict of interest going on. But you take a stand, you do the right thing, and you don't lie, amazing things happen. I'm just saying, anybody can witness to that? No, that's true, right? But it's a difficult thing to do. It's easy to take the shortcut. No, we don't lie. That puts us in the wrong camp. <laughs> And God's weakness, sorry, will always be stronger than mere human strength. Ha, huh, this is the good part. But now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Okay, so there you go. They were big on first fruits. You know all about that principle. But Jesus is the first one that came out of the grave and stayed out of the grave. All the other people that were resurrected in the Old Testament died again. Bummer. They had to do it twice. <laughs> Jesus kept on living, and he's alive today, making intercession for you and me. That's pretty good. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, for since by man came death, that would have been Adam, right? By man also came what? Resurrection. The resurrection of the dead. You happy about that, Martin? Hallelujah. Cure to cancer, right on the front row. He had a grapefruit sticking out of his neck. You know, he's got a good voice, doesn't he? So what did the enemy want to do? Take out his voice. No. Gone. Cancer free. Hallelujah. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. In the future, but now too. We're pulling that not yet into the now. Made alive. Each one of his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Who's in that category here? If he came back today, you're going with him. All right? Good. Glad you know that. If you're not sure, come up for prayer. It's just a matter of inviting him in. Like, there's not a big qualification process here. It's not like my people will get back to you. No, he's ready today to say yes to you if you want to say yes to him. Right now. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. So Jesus did what the Father told him to do. He reversed the mess that was made by Adam. And then he will be handing the kingdom back to his Father. And then we will be ruling and reigning with him forever, for eternity. And again, that should give you lots of hope that no matter what we're dealing with here in this life, it doesn't compare to what we have on the other side for eternity with him. And, you know, in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, it says... Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the things of the Lord, knowing this, that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Hallelujah. It's not just another church service. You're changing a diaper of somebody's baby 
and they got saved in the service. You're parking a car out there, and that's going to be your future wife, even though she gave you a dirty look when she pulled in. <laughs> For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. Worked out pretty good for me. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And then if you jump to verse 42, this is just, we could stand up now. Just so you can stretch your muscles a little bit. And now Paul's going to get into this little bit of a, a back and forth here. He says the body is sown in corruption. We were all born with original sin, right? But what happens? It's raised in incorruption. So you're coming up on the other side with none of that sin. God's an anti-gravity God. It's sown in dishonor, and it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, but it's raised in how much power? The same mighty power that raised Jesus from the dead. We started there in Ephesians right at the beginning. It's sown in a natural body, but it's raised in a spiritual body. There is a natural body and, oops, sorry, wrong way. And there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first Adam became a living being, but the last Adam, who would that be? Jesus, the last Adam, is a life-giving spirit. So if you have the spirit of the Father and the Son in you, you are a life-giving spirit too. Thank you, Lord. Why would I go listen to Led Zeppelin records? You know, that would have been one of my downfalls. I had to go take all my albums and throw them in the back of the garbage truck. One of the benefits, the privileges of being in the garbage business, I could just go right up to the back of the truck. I knew right where they were. <laughs> and uh, business was always picking up. It was amazing. I know. So lame. So lame. Oh, my God. You get paid $5 an hour and all you can eat. Oh, please stop. Come back, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Think about this. You now are a life-giving spirit. You're not just breathing. You're not just taking up space. You've got the same spirit in you that's the life-giving spirit that's the difference between Jesus and, and Adam. That's good news. I'm almost done. Everything has an order. The body's not an, uh, animated first, uh, empowered by the spiritual, first the physical comes, and then the spiritual becomes its life-giving source. So you see how powerful the Holy Spirit is and why it totally changed things, not just when he died on the cross, resurrected. When Holy Spirit came, that was the game changer. And you have to have him or else you couldn't be a Christian. It's just now what are we doing with him? I know I said that last week, but I want to bring this point home because we can take the not yet into now, today. At ShopRite, wherever you go, the gas station, you could be bringing the future into the present because God will speak to you to speak to that person that's pumping our gas, right? He wants that person saved, doesn't he? Okay, well, no respecter of persons. The first man, Adam, came from the earth and was made of dust. Gravity again. The second man, Jesus, has come from heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A version 2.0. Whenever you see the line, that means it's the last slide. Hallelujah. <laughs> the earth man, Adam, we should say it out loud together, right? Since we're on the last one. The earth man, Adam, shares his earth nature with all those made of earth. Likewise, the heavenly man, Jesus, shares his heavenly nature with all those made of heaven. How many here in that category? Ho! Oh. You're anti-gravity. Just as if we carry the image of the earth man in our bodies, we will also carry the image of the heavenly man in our new bodies at the resurrection. That's the not yet is going to become the now. My whole point of saying all this today is just to give you hope. Like I said, we should be the most hope-filled people on the planet. But life just has a way. There's such a daily dry, grinding process of life that if we're not careful, we can drift from the excitement that we should be having. Because really, like that song, we, we, we don't do it really much, but there is a song that says, there's always someone else who would love to be in your shoes. There's always someone else who's worse off than you. 
no matter what that is. So you have a choice to be grateful. In all things, give thanks. That's a hard one, isn't it? With my boss? Yeah, even with your boss. If he gets saved, the whole company will get saved. Amen? Can you believe for that? Let's raise our hands. Lord, we just ask you to bubble up inside of us with that hope, the hope that you give. Only you can give the truth of your word, but also the power of your spirit. And if there's anybody here, if you don't know the Lord, I'm telling you, there's a bunch of people here that would love to pray with you and let you know that it's the best decision that you could ever make. Well, you're the pastor. Of course, you're going to say that. No, I'm, no, I'm like the guitar player, basically, okay? It's the best thing you could ever do. But you have to overcome the enemy trying to nail your feet into the floor right now and say, don't do it, don't do it. You're going to have to give up all these things. Believe me when I tell you, whatever you give up, you're going to get back a hundredfold better, way better, way better. It's just saying, you know what, Jesus, I've tried this way. It hasn't been working. I'm going to try you. Trisha gave him an ultimatum and said, I'll give you a year. He was really threatened by that, I know. But it worked. She's still here. Hallelujah. Anybody that doesn't know the Lord? It's really just as easy as asking him in. It's just, it's just making a request to a God who loves you. He was in your mother's womb when you were conceived. He was there been with you all the way, waiting. Another song says, waiting patiently in line for you to say, you know what, Lord, I, I need you. I can't keep running away from you. I want to run towards you. It's okay. If nobody's here, that's okay. But could you raise your hands, those that are here? It means you're all serving God. Let's just pray for a greater engine roar on the inside like we sang today. Lord, I thank you for the tribe at King of Kings that's here, those that are watching that the not yet is coming into the now by faith, Lord. We believe that the things that we cannot see, we're going to focus our eyes on the things we cannot see because they are going to live forever. That's the eternal work that you called us to do. So in every situation of our lives, we ask you to make that point real to us, that we will take every thought captive and that we will be about your business because I'll say it again. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the things of the Lord, knowing this, that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So I receive it. Amen. Go eat cake. No. Bagels. No. Vegetables. <laughs> or if you need prayer, please come up to the front and...